All right, what was the oldest car you ever owned or drove? The oldest? Oldest. Uh, let's see. It would be my first car, which was a Toyota Camry, and it was, I think, a 1998. And what year did you get rid of it? Uh, let's see. Well, it stayed around in the family um, <laughs> for probably 15 more years, and it had close to 300,000 miles on it. And the reason why it died is it was total due to a deer. Ah, mm -hmm. they have done many of my vehicles into. We've, yeah. I think we've lost three that have been totaled to deer over the years. I saw a ton of of deer on the side of the road um, yesterday on my way to Winchester. I was like, oh, Stay it's that season. It <laughs> yep. is Just that season. Don't run to the headlights. Now, yeah. Nikki Maria said she donated her lawn tractor to hospice. Can we expect to see you driving her lawn tractor <laughs> around the grounds? Um, I like to think that I am pretty handy and can do just about anything. So if need be, sure, Bill. <laughs> nice. I like that attitude, Nick. Good stuff. Uh, November is palliative care month. And uh, we've done many segments with hospice in the past regarding palliative care. Nikki, maybe you could explain what that is for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. So really more than 40 years now, hospice has helped provide interdisciplinary supportive care to really millions of people across the country, um, which really allowing them to spend their final months wherever they call home, patients and families being able to be surrounded by their loved ones. And with that, National Hospice and Palliative Care Month is an opportunity um, really for patients, providers, community members alike to really engage in um, important discussions about the care they wish to receive when facing a serious illness, but also allowing them to engage in advanced care planning um, before, you know, someone is faced with a crisis or faced um, with that diagnosis. And one of the really great things about this month every year is they try to highlight, um, they being National Hospice um, and the palliative care organization in which we align with um, they do a theme every year, and this year's theme is titled uh, Courageous Conversations. Um, and you know what? That couldn't be more true in the work that we do every single day is have those courageous conversations. Um, sometimes those conversations, unfortunately, can be really difficult to have, but they're absolutely necessary. Yeah. Uh, Nikki, uh, what do we mean by palliative care? I know what palliative is treatment of pain. Is there a certain threshold that has to be identified before someone could be admitted to a palliative care program? No. When a, a Bill, when a patient's not eligible for hospice care, um, certainly they may benefit from a community-based palliative care program like ours. Um, not every hospice provider offers palliative care, but we are fortunate enough to offer it to our community and certainly still a new program, only two and a half years old. But palliative care is still patient and family-centered um, care that really optimizes quality of life by anticipating and preventing and treating suffering um, and really focusing on that advanced disease, advanced illness. And palliative care really is a piece of uh, the care continuum of the illness. And it also, um, it doesn't just treat the disease. It doesn't just treat the diagnosis. It really involves addressing the physical, um, psychosocial, emotional, spiritual needs, and really facilitates patient autonomy through access to information, and I would say access um, to that information to be able to make informed choices. Do we have certain diseases more associated with palliative care than others? Um, well, one of the most common misconceptions that still hangs out um, around hospice and palliative care that it's only for cancer, and that's not true. Um, so. We see palliative care patients and hospice patients, all sorts of diseases, but I would say heart disease, uh, certainly cardiovascular disease, uh, stroke, um, neurological conditions like dementias, um, maybe Legere's disease, uh, multiple sclerosis. So no, not just one specific diagnosis. It's really kind of a mixed bag. You mentioned dementia uh, and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, that there's a pain element to that, but generally there is not a pain element. Uh, when do you start getting involved with Alzheimer's or dementia patients? Yeah, so unfortunately with Alzheimer's or any form of dementia, Bill, um, it, 
that's a disease that typically has a longer, slow pro progressing trajectory. And typically when someone is hospice eligible or palliative eligible, it's usually um, a result of a complication of the disease. So as it affects the different body systems, um, patients and people can develop um, complications related to that as such maybe if they have difficulty swallowing um, and end up with some type of aspiration pneumonia, um, we see people as they become debilitated from the de disease and maybe bed bound that may develop different type of um, bed sores, ulcers, wounds, those sorts of things and have complications from those. Maria. Um, so one of the things, um, Nikki, that, you know, that we talk about a lot Obviously, Hospice of the Panhandle um, was founded in 1980, um, and we began this palliative care program in just two and a half years ago. And I think, um, you know, what we what we aim to do, especially with palliative care, is treat more and more people. Um, Bill was asking, talk about palliative care. So, all hospice is palliative, but not all palliative is hospice. So. In the palliative care program, talk a little bit about, Nikki, about what people um, can expect and what they can still be having in terms of treatment when yeah. they're a palliative patient of Panhandle Palliative Services. Boy, we like that alliteration, don't we? Absolutely. PPS. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the biggest things, our, our goal for this program is to keep people out of the hospital, right, and reduce hospital uh, readmissions, keep people in the comfort of their home. Um, think of this service as a specialist. It is a specialty service just as a neurologist, just as a cardiologist. However, in this case, the service that we offer is home-based, meaning a provider comes to your home. Um, we have two full-time nurse practitioners that go to patients' homes, um, really just working on uh, goals with the patient, whether that's pain goals, um, symptom management goals, um, coordinating um, different things. I'm thinking of a recent story of a patient. Um, the biggest, uh, this gentleman had a congestive heart failure diagnosis, and he, for months, has not been able to get out of the recliner chair. And one of the reasons was that he can't lay flat. He, he's so short of breath, he can't lay flat. So the team really came in. Um, Dr. Johnston made some adjustments to his diuretic, his medicine, um, to hopefully help with some of that shortness of breath. And the team um, worked together with the social worker on the palliative care team to get this gentleman a hospital bed. And within 24 hours, that was, that was life-changing to that gentleman because he was able to get out of the recliner and actually get into a bed where he was comfortable and lay down because of the head of the bed elevated. But something just as simple as a piece of medical equipment and the slightest medication adjustment. But being able to have that provider come into the home and, and assess exactly what's going on um, really speaks volumes. The program is fairly new, as Maria mentioned, two, two and a half to three years. How many patients do you have involved in the palliative care program now? Yep, so today we have just shy of 170 patients in the program. Um, I was reflecting with our leadership team yesterday at a leadership training. Um, we started this year at 98 patients, and we have certainly grown. Um, certainly that number kind of jumps all over the place because there are times where patients get referred to palliative care and they're actually eligible for hospice care. Or patients in palliative care might see a change in their health and they end up getting referred over to our hospice service. This leads to another question. Uh, do you have to, for someone to get in palliative care, do they have to be referred by a doctor? Not necessarily. Anybody can refer to our program. And anybody can refer to hospice. Absolutely. Now, in, in, order to, in order to get admitted, you need to have a physician say for the hospice program that if the disease progresses along its normal trajectory, that he or she believes that the person would pass within six months. So that's sort of the difference. There's no time limit on the um, palliative. on the palliative. I mean, we've had some people, a lady that I had a conversation with 
at church Christmas two years ago um, is still in our palliative care program. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, you can come and 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 get the benefit and um, and and stay on. So. Yeah, everyone is different, and everyone, absolutely, and everyone has a different threshold of pain. And I'm going to use a very extreme example, uh, Nikki. If somebody twists their ankle and <laughs> is temporarily in severe pain. I'm, I would assume they would not be eligible for the program. But that leads me into the question, what are the threshold guidelines that you use? Yeah, so um, very different than hospice yet again. Um, there really are no set guidelines set forth by Medicare or by some larger governing body. Um, the really the key component and the difference in that situation, Bill, is that that's something acute, and we know that we'll get better. Um, for palliative care, it's people with a serious illness or an advanced illness, and typically those illnesses are chronic, and we know they're not going to go away. So Good that's, answer. Thank you. Yeah. So that's the that's kind of the difference. Nikki, talk a little bit about some of the things that we have going on, both internally and externally, um, in terms of National Hospice and Palliative Care Month. Yeah, so this is certainly not just an opportunity to um, recognize all of our staff for the hard work that goes on um, every single day uh, throughout the year, but really trying to um, get a little more involved in the community. And so next week uh, we'll kick off um, really trying to post a lot more on social media just to give the community an idea of kind of what is going on. Um, definitely look for a press release article going out in the journal. Um, tomorrow, uh, Maria and myself are meeting with the Berkeley County Council. The, there is an official proclamation um, for National Hospice and Palliative Care Month. Um, we also deliver uh, white remembrance roses to all of our community physicians that have referred to our program within the last 12 months um, that have had a patient that have died. And so we, everyone will get a white rose, all the doctors, um, with a handwritten card delivered to the doctors with remembering those patients that uh, we cared for in the program in 2023. Um, we also um, are doing, on for Veterans Day, we'll have Veterans Day flags outside of our main office uh, out in Kearneysville. The flags will go out on the Friday, I believe, or Monday before Veterans Day, and we'll stay out for the full week. And each flag represents a veteran um, that has passed or that we have cared for within our program in the last year. So lots of just uh, lots of community outreach, speaking engagements with civic organizations, churches, the chamber. Uh, we're taking any and all opportunities to really just spread the word. And I also, speaking of the social media, um, even though hospice now, you know, as a movement started as a movement 40 years ago, there are so many common misconceptions that still exist out there. So. Part of the, our social media uh, presence that we're going to be doing is um, myth versus facts to really uh, dispel some of those myths and make sure people truly have that base understanding, factual information about hospice and palliative care. So I was I was telling both Rob and um, and Bill Nikki that um, that our new. Um, that our new ad is getting ready to launch because we had Warren's story um, came on during one of the breaks, but the the new story will launch next week, and it is the the story of the Crow family um, from Crow's uh, grocery store, um, where we've taken care of multiple family members. Um, but one of those myths that we continue to have to try to bust all the time is that hospice is for the last three days of life. Yeah. You don't call until it's the end, and then for three days we take care of you, and then you die. And that's yeah. that's so untrue. I mean... But it is how most people think of hospice. It, exactly. Absolutely. Except, and, and this is one of the things that Debbie Domenico talks about in the ad, is, you know, her mother was under our care for maybe nine months and her her father for a long period of time as well and you know we just we're trying to emphasize that people should call us sooner even if they don't think that they're 
eligible. We can come in, we can talk about the, the program and we can show you what we can do, how we can help your family, the things that you need. Is the grief counseling services still one of those things, Maria? Oh my gosh. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you want to take that one, Nikki? Talk about yeah, grief. Yeah, sure. No, okay. I, I, that's. I'm not a social worker, but having utilized the services uh, for myself and just so many in this community, and it is like a hidden gem, because people don't realize that you just have to have hospice to access those services. The Center for Grief Support and Loss is a free community resource, and so um, anyone in the community, it's available to. Um, but the Medicare benefit says. Uh, the hospice will provide free services for 13 months after the death of a patient. So they not only serve uh, families following the death, but they also work when the patient, when they're still alive, and with the family on things like anticipatory grieving and loss as well. And I think really just kind of connecting some of these pieces, again, back to this year's theme and, and really hitting on what Maria was saying that, you know, courageous conversations and having necessary, transparent, honest conversations, that's really the key to helping families like the Crowls, you know, sooner rather than later. Is the counseling service available to me even if my uh, lost uh, relative or loved one didn't use hospice? Correct. It is. I, and, I wonder how many people understand that I, part. And, and uh, you know, and we tell people all the time, you know, we've had some extreme losses in um, in the school system this year. There have been um, some suicides. Our grief counselors will go out to the schools and, um, and, and lend a hand and offer counseling to um, students and to teachers um, just all over the board. And, and we try to get that word out. In fact, today, in our um, in our education center, there is a program going on as we speak um, that's sort of highlighting one particular part of um, of our grief program, and that is um, the the loss um, due to opiates. And we received a grant actually from the city of Martinsburg. Oh gosh, Nikki, what a year and a half ago or so. Yeah. And this is mm-hmm. sort of the the final piece of that. We have two folks coming in, talking to social workers, other folks about um, about what that's like, because that's a whole different ball of wax than any other um, any other kind of loss. So Nikki, this integrated service obviously provides great benefit to the community. Uh, but it doesn't come free. Uh, a lot of it re, uh, is covered by reimbursement from Medicare, Medicaid, but then there's a large part that's not covered, and that comes back to the very aggressive community fundraising, one of which is Light Up a Light that's going to happen uh, early part of December, and I think we need probably should discuss that a second. Yeah, absolutely. You're right, Bill. So about 90% of our patients that we serve, um, the funding comes from Medicare, Um, Unfortunately, year after year, Medicare tells us we expect you to do more with less. And so we truly depend on the generosity of this community for us to certainly fill that gap, um, to be able to offer the gamut of services to the to the people, the deserving people of this community, both living and dying. And so one of our last events for this year is Light Up a Life. And this is my one of my personal favorite um, fundraising events that we do because it's such a great way to remember your loved one um, at the holidays. And so the beginning of December, Maria, I'm going to jump to you for the dates. Um, we will be holding um, Light Up a Life ceremonies in Berkeley Springs, um, at our main campus here in Kearneysville, and then a few days after that um, at a funeral home in Hampshire County. But luminary service, um, you can send in in memory of your loved one. Um, and just really, again, a great way uh, to remember your loved one at the holidays. And every single luminary will be tagged with the loved one's name. Um, there, we, I think we have over 2,000 luminaries that we put out here at our main office building, and it's just absolutely beautiful um, to drive onto our main campus and, and see all of the lights. And that date is Sunday, December the 
3rd. Mm-hmm. Yes, Sunday, December the 3rd. Um, ceremony at 5.15. Um, but the lights are on all night. And if you're interested, uh, you can go to our brand new revamped website, which just debuted on Monday. Yay. Um, and you can donate there if you haven't gotten the flyer. If you've donated before, you should have gotten a flyer in the mail. Um, unless you're Bill Stubblefield, who says, well, I don't know if I want the flyer. I'm kidding. No, no, no. I, I get a flyer. <laughs> he got a flyer. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So, but good. it's it's not only a, an opportunity to pay uh, uh, to re- revive the memory of your loved one, but it's such a lovely evening. You folks oh do gosh. a professional job, and it's a, you come away, I come away feeling just both moved and feeling very good about not only remembering my loved one, but this community, this caring, compassionate community. Absolutely. And the last thing I'll say about that, which I really appreciate, is that we read through every single name that was sent in to us that evening as well. Uh, Charlene on our Facebook uh, stream wrote, my husband had a friend that was being treated by hospice and after a period of time, he actually improved to the point where he no longer needed hospice and he lived another five years, Nikki. That's a pretty good testament. And that happens That happens as well. Um, maybe 10% of our patients are, um, are discharged. Um, and, you know, we go in, we look, we, we look at the trajectory of the disease, and sometimes people do get better. Nikki, so. 15 seconds. Where can people find out more about Hospice of the Panhandle? Absolutely. Uh, Maria mentioned our brand new website. I would recommend hospiceotp.org or calling us at the main office, 304-264-0406. Thank you, Nikki. Have a great day. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Nikki Thanks. Nikki Biagirelli, Bye, and she is the CEO of Hospice of the Panhandle. It has a wonderful Italian name, so always welcome <laughs> on the program. 